Hi, I started with this wonderful photograph of Michael Lenson, the painter, um, because it's just so perfect for the period. I love the hat, I love the suit. Um, and I think it went out in Stockton email. I'm not sure if it was in other publicity and press. It was, people are nodding. Okay, so uh, I've titled this The Paintings in Context. Basically, I told uh, Barry, the artist's son, that I wanted to run through a bunch of pictures talk a little bit about the art, and then I would sort of have warmed everybody up, everybody will feel familiar with the work, and then he can talk about his father and his father's working methods and what he remembers of his father's work, and it would be sort of in a context for you already. I wanted to start with this one partly because I love this painting and partly because for me this shows an artist at a crossroad. It's an artist standing between two easels the easel close to us has something figural, a, a woman, a figural subject, something that we can recognize. And the back one, it, it's possible that he's just priming the canvas, but it looks for all the world to me like an abstract expressionist painting. This is a portrait of the artist's wife, June, who was Barry's mother. And this I'm equating to, to this, the figural subject on the left. Everybody gets it. 1940s. In 1947, Jackson Pollock painted the first drip painting. Abstraction was big. Artists were having to literally position themselves, like this artist on the left, as to where they wanted to be between abstraction and realism or naturalism. Next. Um, and so I put in a Willem de Kooning, which everybody knows is a colleague, was a colleague of uh, Jackson Pollock. And this is for the purely abstract purely formalist, all about the lines, the shapes, the colors, the textures, and it looked a little bit like the painting in the background. Next. 1953, this is a very similar painting. They're both from the early 50s. This is 1953 and 51 on the left, right after Jackson Pollock has introduced the drip paintings, right after de Kooning and Mark Rothko, and Franz Klein are all painting uh, very subject-less, object-less images, images that are only about color, shape, texture, and gesture. And I just happen to like both of these. Next. Partly because they show the artist's studio in Nutley, New Jersey. Barry, is this your house? Yes. This is the house you grew up in? You can find amazing things on Google and going, taking the little person to street view. So I really just went to the enclosure in Nutley, New Jersey and took the little man and had him walk around until it looked like he was looking at number 16. Where was the skylight? On the opposite side of the house. Okay, in the back or on the left behind, the, in the back. Okay, great, I couldn't have told you that before. Next. So before Nutley, I've sort of jumped in in the early 50s. Before Nutley, next, uh, Michael Lenson had won the Schaliner Prize, which allowed him to study abroad for several years, three to four years. So this is Michael Lenson between two beautiful women in Paris. Next. And this is also Michael Lenson in Paris. And I love the fact that there's, ab uh, there's an African carving on the wall because who maybe a decade and a half earlier had also been looking at, at African art in Paris. The lady's nodding. Do you know? Picasso. You know, I, Picasso. I, probably everybody knew, more or less. Uh, and I love that this is such a wonderful picture of an artist posing. Uh, not a studio at workshop, but posing uh, you know, on, on the bookshelf with the African art behind him. Next. There is a portrait from about the same time, self-portrait of Michael Lenson. Next. Which I think is in here? Yes. All the way in the corner by Barry. Next. So he returned to the U.S. having studied abroad, having studied art in Paris, having studied with a muralist in England, in London, um, came back to his New York family, wasn't getting work. What's going on at this time? The Great Depression. He goes to New Jersey and is hired uh, by the, the New Deal, WPA, in New Jersey and becomes an assistant supervisor for the Federal Art Project in New Jersey. This is just a, an exhibition catalog from around the same time. Saskia? And starts painting murals. 
This one doesn't exist anymore, but it is a, it was a huge, I forgot to put in the size of the painting, a huge wall mural at Essex Mountain Sanatorium, Essex County, the town of Verona. Like a lot of WPR, WPA art, which seems very comfortable and familiar to us at this point, it has factories, you know, American know-how, American uh, technological prowess. It has farmers and farm families and uh, the, the nuclear family that, you know, is, is king at this point. Um, next. I found this on the internet. It's just such a great photograph of a mural that no longer exists. It has that old brown sepia color to it. But that's the same uh, sanitarium photograph, tuberculosis sanitarium. Next. And paints more murals. I only put in a couple slides of this, but it, at Weekwake High School, he painted the History of the Enlightenment of Man, which is a, um, a romp through history starting with the ancient Egyptians and Romans, and I think those are Egyptians on the right rolling something, and Romans on their horses, centurions in armor. Next. Up to modern times, modern times for Depression era, with uh, American technology in the back right, airplanes and, uh, re re what do you call those things, propellers, whirring around, and factories, and miners, a scene of miners in the bottom left uh, with some sort of explosion in the mine pit. Next. And a painting from around the same time so that you see it closer up. Subjects from this time, this is a sadder one, but they were often optimistic. They often presented uh, American families, American farms, American uh, industrial know-how uh, as supported by the U.S. government in the form of the Federal Art Project, uh, the WPA, and a number of programs. Next. Another mural, also no longer with us, 1939 for the World's Fair. It looks a little, from what I can see, it looks a little jazzier, a little more about color and line, although we don't see it in a black and white photograph, but um, interesting shapes and interesting patterns. And as you see, he had a, a crew of assistants who helped him put this mural together in a very short period of time. Saskia. Nutley and later. Since I started in 1951, I sort of divided it there. Next. Another mural in New Jersey, and he did paint quite a few murals in New Jersey, was for a school in Newark. Oh, sorry, it's another school in Newark. Weekwick High School was the first. Here's 14th Avenue School, and it is a simplified, uh, not quite monochrome, but limited color palette of, of two walls, each of which expresses two of the freedoms that Roosevelt had talked about in his Four Freedoms speech of 1941. You see, I have all the little clues in case I forget the date. Uh, so we see freedom of worship here with the church in the background, and I can't actually read that. Um, next, we'll see what other ones I put in. For freedom of worship again, and freedom of speech. And next, freedom from want, and the other one's a freedom from also. Anybody remember? Fear. I don't remember. Yeah, fear. fear. Could be fear. Okay, next. He was among a number of artists, 19 artists, who were chosen to... Um, to, to provide illustrations for the president's speech in a lovely little publication. Hugo Gellert did the cover portrait of Roosevelt. Next. And this is his illustration for that book presentation of the Four Freedoms speech. Next. Electronics Corporation of America. I just love this photograph. It's from an old brochure put out by the company. Um, and, and like the World's Fair mural, I think this one looks a little jazzier. There's a musician in the top left playing violin. There's a keyboard floating out in space. There's an ear as if listening to the music. There are the masks of theater, sadness and happiness. Um, there's a shore subject. 
science types of imagery on the right. It's all about modern America, both the arts um, and industry. Next. So among my favorites are these murals, a series of eight murals of the history of Newark that are still there at Newark City Hall. They're from 1941. All of these murals are from the late 30s, early 40s. Um, and this is the story of Newark's history, New Jersey's history, if you will. Next. I have close-ups of these because Barry found old glass slides, color glass slides in a, in a box that had been perfectly preserved. And so we've got the colors of the original murals. Native Americans and the arrival of European settlers. Everybody sort of gets that, the men on the right. Next. Uh, the beginnings of trade, and I think it's industry in the foreground, but I didn't look it up. Next. Cabin building, and the man in the center is Robert Treat laying out the city, uh, city grid for Newark. Next. An early outbreak against the British that occurred in Newark. Michael Lenson had researched uh, the history of Newark in order to put the mural series together in, in order to present something to the, to the board that chose the images. Um, and he had found a very early Revolutionary War event in, that had occurred in Newark. So that, of course, made it into one of the murals. Next. Those, those were the Brits looking not very <laughs> pleasant on the left. Uh, the growth of Newar Newark. We have a tavern in the background, a Pony Express stop, the carriage. Um, a shoemaker working in the foreground, and an American family. Next. Smelting, one of Newark's industries. And I love these. They're, they're American heroes, the American worker as hero, which was also a big topic in the uh, Depression era art. Next. And leather working. And I point out in the top right the inclined plane of the Morris Canal. Uh, the Morris Canal went through a series of locks and a series of inclined planes that allowed uh, boats, <clears throat> uh, you know, industrial materials to traverse the New Jersey countryside into Newark. Next. And it ends with the railroad and a signature at the bottom right. You can see Michael Lenson's signature pretty clearly. Well, it's actually a man on a on, with horses and carriage trying to outrace the railroad, which we know isn't going to last for long, um, the ability to do that. But you can see, you can't read the signatures, but he had a crew helping him with this series also. Next. So what they're not, they are WPA art. They are federal art project art. What they're not is abstract, obviously. The WPA did not sponsor very much abstraction, but we had some of the famous examples here in New Jersey. We had the Arshio Gorky murals at Newark Airport. Uh, aerial map. Do you see a, a rough approximation of the US uh, silhouette, the country, with airlines flying across it? And imagine it if he was trying to do that today. <laughs> How many routes would there be? How many hubs would there be? OK, next. And the mechanics of flying, which is a little more generic. It looks like an engine. It looks like pistons. It looks like things that turn wheels. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what all the parts are. Um, but flat, abstract shapes. 1936, 37, this is a decade before Jackson Pollock paints those first drip paintings. But abstraction's been in the air for some time. And every American artist, Arshil Gorky was uh, Armenian, but had come here and settled in New York. Every American artist has to position himself or herself during these years on a, on a fulcrum, from complete abstraction to complete realism, na naturalism. Next. And I just like this, because some of you might know Noguchi. The artist Noguchi, who after this worked almost entirely in abstraction, think big stone circles, stone columns, wooden carved with textures, wooden beams, wooden circles, very simple, simple geometric shapes, did a female figure reclining and writing a letter for the Haddon Heights post office. Um, the post office has got a lot of new art during the New Deal. You may already know that. Next. <clears throat> 
So Lenson as a New Deal artist, I think one of the other best pieces of the mural art is this one from uh, West Virginia. It's a mining scene. <clears throat> it's still there, you can Google it. There's a great photo of how it looked last Christmas or the Christmas before and so the, the post office people had lined up electric lights along the bottom of, you know, Christmas lights, along the bottom of the mural and around some signs and doors and I just couldn't bring myself to put it in because it, it didn't seem respectful of the art, but you can find it if you, if you Google Michael Lenson West Virginia mural. Next. I was gonna be shocked if I did leave it in. I had it in briefly. Um, this made it onto the poster, I think, for the show, and it is one of two murals for an apartment building in New York, 1944, kind of getting toward the end of the New Deal era. Um, but you see the same things that I, the same themes I've been talking about all along, uh, and it's in a museum in Florida nowadays. Next. So we have Michael Lenson and his wife June on the left. June and their first child, David, on the right, and family remains a subject for the rest of Michael Lenson's uh, life, his painting career, in one form or another. All these, these this cast of characters, plus Barry, who's <laughs> sitting in the back, appear in quite a few paintings. Next. Didn't mean to take too long. I'm supposed to keep an eye on this. Okay, uh, June and Michael Lenson, I love this photograph. And Barry probably knows what I'm gonna do with this photograph next. Another famous couple <laughs> I've, that I've referred to from this time, someone who chose to go in the direction of complete uh, abstraction. That is Lee Krasner and her husband, Jackson Pollock, bottom left. But what I think is adorable is how much the two couples look like each other. <laughs> My mother-in-law had those bangs. <laughs> Yeah, my mom didn't. My mom had more of the 40s, you know, wave kind of hair, but my mom never did the bang thing. Next. One little Pollock drip painting just to remind you what we're talking about. Everybody remembers. I call him Jack the Dripper <laughs> in my classes. Next. I don't think anybody did at the time. So in the late 40s, in the face of all this abstraction, I would say that Michael Lenson went through his most surreal phase. There are some beautiful paintings from this period. Um, they're naturalistic, they look real, they're identifiable subjects, um, and they often have a little bit of an edge. Uh, um, they're beautiful color schemes and interesting subjects. This is called Sea Sally, but it looks like a, a fair, an amusement park, with some sort of ominous shapes in the top right that look like uh, torpedoes or bombs to me. 1946, think about it. World War II, next. And power corrupts a kind of social, uh, social study, if you will. 1947, we have various types from the modern city, some of them unsavory types, politicians, the women who hang out with the politicians, we've got strange and interesting things going on in the modern city. Um, and, and this is a theme that comes back occasionally as well. Next. This might, well, no, I just put in a different artist from an earlier period, Reginald Marsh. Uh, typo there, why not use the L just to suggest social, social concerns in art of the modern city, but this is a little bit earlier. Next. Um, and my favorite from this period isn't particularly about social concerns at all. I just love the big fish kite in the foreground. Uh, Carnival, 1949. Next. I told you I put in a lot. Okay, we're, we're on the verge of a change. 1954, a construction site with a curiously ghost-like image sketched in at the right as if maybe he's a, uh, a construction worker who's died on site or he's a construction, construction worker from an earlier period, um, sitting there having his lunch on lunch break, what seems the most real is the wooden barriers and the, um, I'm guessing, oil lamp or you know that, that fire in the foreground and the street, the pavement, all seems more real than the figure. Next. What, what do you see? Well, the title's Expulsion, and it is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from 
Eden, but what style do you start to see? Cubism. Cubism. So we've just seen a little bit of surrealism, and surrealism and cubism inform a lot of Michael Lenson's work for the rest of his life. Look around you in the gallery, you'll see some of it. Um, in this continuum between abstraction and realism, there were a lot of artists who worked in the middle. And there were a lot of artists who drew on surrealism and cubism, one or the other or both, um, for what they wanted to do. There were a lot of people who didn't quite go to abstraction. Um, and there were also a lot of people who did. So I think this one's interesting. The expulsion, next I put in a little comparison just to show you an old-fashioned version. Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling. Um, a little more typical subject, but the Lenson version on the left is equally angst-filled at having, you know, these, this couple has done the one thing they were told not to do, and they won't be staying in the pretty place forever. Next. The family. As I said, subjects that keep recurring in Lenson's work. Here's Afternoon at Cape Cod with an artist at work, a woman, and presumably one of two small children. We've got colors that are not entirely cubist, um, and I might have put in next uh, an, a Picasso example of cubism. Right. High analytical cubism on the right, very reduced in colors, but Michael Lenson's updated version of it is much more colorful and interesting. Um, next. So Lionel Feininger, another American artist who also adopted cubism. I tell my modern art class, cubism influenced more artists than any other style, both in Europe and America. More artists in the 20th century went through a cubist phase than anything else. Yes, surrealism was an influence, but cubism, cubism everybody tried it. Everybody tried cubism. Um, next. So things move along, and I've been coming to grips with these later paintings for a long time, and I th I'm finding them more and more interesting, and I'm finding them ready for revival. They, they have that little bit of surrealism, they have that little bit of cubism, but those influence has, influences have been uh, integrated into something that becomes the artist's mature style. So this is June reading. We've seen June before in a slightly more realistic way. I'm probably out of time. Almost. Next. If you thought the skin tones looked a little disturbing, it was, there was something in the air. Um, there were a number of artists who painted in a realistic manner but made the human figure a little less than beautiful during this period. I put in an Ivan Albright uh, titled A Face from Georgia, a close-up portrait of, of a man that's you know, got that little bit of disturbing texture to the face. Next. And Lucian Freud, the famous British artist, also very painterly. Uh, lots of thick impasto paint on the surface, maybe less in this one than in some, but there are a lot of uh, very introspective portraits from this period. Next. This one I love. This is Michael Lenson, the artist, with, in a self-portrait with a palette, you know, the mixing board that artists use to come up with the right colors, mixing the paints right on the board, held in the hand, and what you see on it is an actual paint rag attached to the canvas. And I want to say that he did it first, but he didn't. Sorry, Barry. Next. I put in Robert Rauschenberg's bed, which is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and it's a little more extreme, but I'm not sure that I like it better. It's a little more, uh, it's a self-portrait of a different type. It's a quilt, sort of an Americana type quilt. It's the artist's sheets, it's the artist's pillow, it's the drip paintings of abstract expressionism, but it's Rauschenberg on the edge of uh, pop art, you know, doing much more um, sort of popular American subjects or incorporating them into his work. So I just like this parallel. Next. Jazz Combo, another colorful, interesting, uh, slightly cubist uh, series of layered colors. Next. Suburban Idol, I didn't have a very good JPEG. It's pixelating a little bit. 
Um, but there is this theme of um, social exploration, you know, sort of social ills. A couple in the suburbs doing things in the same space, but not looking at each other. You know, the sort of anxiety of the post-war America in suburban housing. She seems to have a cat. <laughs> and, and he's drinking and reading the paper, but they don't interact. Next. So I put in an Ivan Albright. I had a face by I Albright before. Um, there were a number of pa painters doing this combination of realism um, and formalism, and many of them exploring society. Next. I couldn't resist putting in In Memoriam, Martin Luther King, 1968. A little bit less cubist, a little bit less abstract, because of course the subject is extremely important. Next. And he did return periodically to things that, that remind us of the WPA era. Remember uh, Disaster in the Pit, Here's Brush Fire, painted almost in that WPA style, a little more realistic than, than other recent paintings. Next. Studio Baroque, did I see it on the wall? It's on the wall over there with better looking color than my JPEG. Um, Art about one studio has been around a long time. We have, uh, at least through the 19th century, but probably back to the, the Renaissance. Here are studies and photographs and drawings and the artist's materials and June Lenson out on the porch, but, uh, out, out the open door. Next. I think we're almost at the end. Gargoyles, another favorite of mine, although I don't know that it got included here today. Gargoyles, who are the gargoyles? Is it the creatures carved of stone that sit up on the cathedral wall? Or is it maybe those funny looking American, probably American tourists down below who are, I don't want to say the ugly Americans abroad, because none of us would be the ugly Americans abroad. But I'm not sure that gargoyles are limited to just the sculptures in the top right. Next, Dwayne Hansen, <laughs> tourists. I'm not going to say ugly Americans because I might look like that on a, on a day at home. Um, other artists exploring the same kinds of subjects. Next. Afternoon at Blasted Oak mm, is almost my last slide. What have we seen before? We've seen the artist at work before. We've seen the artist's wife in paintings before. We've seen this mix of bright colors and transparent overlays and a little bit of cubist feeling. I'm not sure that I see surrealism anymore, um, but it's a beautiful painting. Next. And Michael in June, 1971, shortly before he died, isn't it? 1972? No, he died in 71. 71, okay, so very close to the time of his death. And it's got that, that look of other uh, artists painting in a, in a social realist way. You know, it's not just beautiful. But I think that what's interesting about these paintings is um, the social concerns that they arise out of and the mix of recent styles uh, finally culminating in the artist's own personal style. That might be next. Is <laughs> but I have a slide that comes up. Yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> I like my VN slide. <laughs> Barry has a few photographs, I think, to show. We just have to rig things up. Let me just start out by thanking everyone for coming. I'm Barry Lenson, I'm the artist's son. Uh, just to put in a little bit of context, it used to be when I got up to talk about my father who was born in 1903, someone would say to me, you're the artist's grandson, right? You can't be the artist's son, right? Because <laughs> he was born 112 years ago. But no, I'm his son. Uh, my father was born in 1903, which we'll talk about a little bit, and I was born in 1949. So, um, just to kind of give you a temporal outline. So this is an early photograph taken in Galich, Russia, which I'll talk about a little bit, of the family before they came. Now with this, I want to actually try and experiment with this, okay? Um, so we have on the left my two grandparents, who I never met. We have my aunt Dasha. Um, and then we have six that right? Six out of my, out of the seven brothers in the family. 
So what I want to ask is, I want to take a vote and see which one of these people you thought grew up to become an artist. Just by looking at them. Okay, maybe, I don't know, show of hands or something possibly. Okay, how many people think this person became an artist and was my father? Okay, okay. Well, you know, Aunt Dasha didn't grow up to be my father. It was too early for all that stuff to be happening. You know, people changing genders. How many people think this could be the artist? That's my father. Okay, one vote for that. Okay, how many people think this person could be the artist? Okay, we have a good show of hands. How about him? Okay, about, so, so far it's kind of a tie. How about, how about this little palooka? Okay, about three hands. And how about this little guy? Okay, so a couple votes. So actually the person who, who grew up to uh, be the artist is this guy. That's my dad. And so what, is there something about him that makes one think that maybe he would grow up to be an artist? Yeah, any, okay, please. It was obvious, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say obvious, but he was quite introspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, anyone else too? Any reasons? Yeah, I think so. For me, it's kind of the eyes, you know, he's very intense. He was always very intense. Um, just, this is, just to tell you who, who the, uh, the also runs were, this is my uncle Yasha, who became a dentist after they came to New York. That's um, my aunt, uh, Yasha Dasha, okay. She married three men and pretty much killed them all. Uh, this is my, yeah, she was a bit of a man eater. But anyway, that's, that's my uncle Dud, who uh, became a clothing wholesaler in New York City. Um, that's my dad, that's his younger brother, Bill, who uh, opened a dental laboratory in New York City after they got here. That's my uncle Al. And that's my Uncle Sam. Now it's possible that maybe, he's not as well remembered now as he was a couple of decades ago, but um, he went on to become Sam Levinson in America, who was kind of a famous, um, he was a very successful writer. He was on the Ed Sullivan show. He had his own television show for a while, but it all, it all started here. Okay. And um, so we can leave this one up for a little while. Um, uh, so they, 1903, my father was born in Russia. And it's, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, my grandfather, you see on the left, was a guild master tailor. And so he, by virtue of the fact that he had credentials, um, he was able to live anywhere he wanted in Russia. Uh, there were a couple categories of people who could live anywhere they wanted. Uh, if you were a veteran of the Tsar's army, we have to remember this is Tsarist times, you could move anywhere you wanted. If you were a guildmaster tailor, you could move anywhere you wanted. So uh, my grandfather um, was not required to live in something that was called the Pale of Jewish Habitation, which was established by Catherine the Great. You know, you, that's why so many people, so many Jewish people, if you ask them where they're from, they're from the Ukraine or Poland. Um, but he, my, my grandfather, I think, was a bit of a courageous guy, even though I never met him. He, he took the family 180 miles northeast of Moscow to this town in the middle of no place. There were no other Jewish people there. Um, he, uh, he, they went camping. He took his kids camping. There was a lake in this town, Golich, which you could, now there's something called Golich.com that you can look at. And you can see images of this lake that my father told me about. They would, it froze in the winter. They would, they would take sleds across the lake. They would go camping, all kinds of stuff. And the reason why I mention this is I think that some of that gumption that my grandfather had also transferred to my dad. My dad, um, you know, he was living in Newark. He was the head of the WPA. He found a studio house in Nutley, New Jersey, just moved there, you know, didn't, uh, didn't think twice about what kind of town is this, nothing. It was a studio, that was it. He went for it, so. But in 1911, uh, a couple of my father's oldest brothers had already come to New York. Um, the rest of the family, the people you see here, actually this guy, Yasha, was already in New York. And um, so then the rest of the family came over in 1911. 
um, took up residence in the back room. The whole family lived in the back room of my grandfather's tailor shop on 106th and Madison Avenue in New York City. Um, there was not, not a lot of money to be made. Um, out in Golich, where they came from, um, I think one of the reasons why my grandfather went there is there was actually a need for a tailor. Um, a cousin of mine still has a suit that my grandfather made. Um, and uh, he was making clothes for uh, Russian army officers, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, he came to New York in 1911, lived on the Upper East Side, um, close to the Metropolitan Museum. Um, so we, my father would take walks and uh, the Metropolitan Museum became kind of his temple. He went in and copied works, studied works. Um, he went to Commerce High School, which is the same place that Lou Gehrig went to high school. Lou Gehrig was a year, you know, the, the Yankee, whatever his nickname was. Um, so my dad went to Commerce High School, dropped out of Commerce High School to pretty much paint. And that didn't sit very well with the family. There was a lot of tension. My father was also um, not a religious person. Um, and that didn't sit well. All the other guys became professionals. My father didn't. So my father ended up moving out, dropping out of high school, living on, in a, like a hovel on the Upper East Side of Manhattan with two other artists who became actually pretty famous, Lou, uh, Louis Guglielmi and Gregorio Prestepino, uh, who he kind of remained friends with. So he um, dropped out of high school. He was working in um, the post office in New York. He was working for uh, airbrushing, he used to say airbrushing shoes for catalogs. So by the time he was 25 or so, things were not working out very well. He wasn't making a lot of money, wasn't getting much positive feedback. Um, he applied for the, um, the Schaliner Foundation Prize, which was in 1928, uh, an $8,000 prize which is a nice chunk of change in 1928. Um, while he was studying in Europe, it, um, it got raised. They raised him up to $10,000. So he studied at the Slade School of Art in London, which accounts, he always said, for his excellent draftsmanship. There's a wall of drawings back there. Also at the Académie des, uh, Académie des Beaux-Arts in Paris, and he exhibited in both places. He studied in Spain, uh, came back, to America um, in 1932. I'm thinking, did I leave anything important? Oh, he was, had a very romantic, actually, there's one other picture. So this is my father during his Val Rudolf Valentino period. <laughs> um, I showed this to somebody not long ago, and he said, you look just like him. I said, oh, no, I don't look just like him. <laughs> I wish I looked just like him. So he was in his mid-20s at this point, Oh, this is a slightly different photo. Um, this is when he was living and studying in Paris. He had a studio on a street that's very near what's now the, the Montparnasse skyscraper, the Tour Montparnasse in Paris. Um, I actually found the building about a year ago and went and looked at the building. So there he was in Europe, having a big, interesting, romantic life. Came back to the US, 1932. Um, had a, about three or four very well-reviewed exhibitions and galleries in New York, but um, got broadsided essentially by the Great Depression. Um, nobody's buying paintings when they can't put food on the table. So um, he was in New, in New York, applied to get on the WPA rolls in New York. Um, they wouldn't um, hire him uh, he told an, um, an interviewer later on, somebody from the Smithsonian Inst Institution in 1964, that they had to prove you were destitute or that you couldn't get hired by the government. So, and he had two older brothers, Yasha, who you might remember <laughs> from the first slide, Yasha, who was a dentist, and he also had another brother, the first one who came over, who was a doctor. So it's like, we can't hire you up for the WPA, you're not poor enough. So he, um, this is pre, I guess, online research age. He came to New Jersey, went to Halsey Street in Newark, applied for a job on the WPA, and got hired. Um, they, 
were looking for somebody to paint that big mural in the, uh, in the cafeteria that Kate showed a picture of. It was uh, 17 feet high and 75 feet wide. And uh, my father had assisted a, a muralist in Europe named Colin Gill. And um, they said to him, can you paint this mural? And my father, I guess, was gutsy and he said, sure, I can paint it. So he took two years and painted it. Um, and that, by the time he was done with that, he'd been made head of the uh, mural activities for the state of New Jersey. Um, WPA ended. Kate actually spoke in good detail about some of his murals and where they are. Uh, WPA ended, wrapped up in about 1942, right? And at that point, um, he had moved to Nutley, New Jersey. Nutley is a funny name for a town. In the old days, when Jack Parr had the Tonight Show, um, he would, uh, he would uh, this is older, <laughs> predates just about everybody here, but if he wanted to laugh, he would just say Nutley, New Jersey. He'd say, I, I got here late tonight because I got stuck in traffic in Nutley, New Jersey, and everybody would laugh. Because <laughs> it is a ridiculous name for a town. But, he, um, but Nutley has an interesting artistic history, believe it or not. Um, the street that he moved to is a street called The Enclosure. And there were four, there still are four important 19th century homes that have big studios on the back of them in Nutley, New Jersey. So the one that he bought in 1941, and which I grew up in, uh, was uh, bought by an American artist named Frank Fowler, who also studied in Paris, um, built a studio on the back of the house. Among other things, Frank Fowler painted the, assisted in the painting of the murals in the Luxembourg Palace, in the, the Medici Palace in the Luxembourg Gardens. So he came back, built a studio on the back of the house, um, sold the house in about 1901 to the Marsh family. So um, he sold it to Frederick Dana Marsh, who was a, an illustrator who did, among other things, the murals that were in the Waldorf Astoria in New York. Um, he, his son, who was actually born in Paris, was Reginald Marsh, who was a, you know, one of America's most well-regarded muralists. His fabulous mural is at the old um, Customs House on the southern tip of Manhattan. Um, so um, I'd like to think that I, my bedroom when I was a kid was Reginald Marsh's bedroom. I don't know if it was or not. Um, also, James Marsh. I'm just finding out more about James Marsh. James Marsh was Reginald Marsh's brother, who was a metallic artist. And I just found out that he did the gates that are on Sarah Lawrence College, the, the big gates that open the campus. Anyhow, it's just so a very artistic kind of environment. Um, how, am I, how am I doing on time? I just don't want to overstay my welcome. Um, Guy Pen de Bois, another American artist, lived in the house for a couple of years, like 1917, 1918. My father bought the house in 1941 for $3,600. Um, continued to paint there until he died in 1971. Um, so Kate has already talked very well about the WPA. I, I, he always painted. That was one of the things that I, that I really learned the most important lessons from my dad in terms of um, how you're supposed to live your life or do your work. Um, it didn't really matter to him in the 1950s that he couldn't get work in galleries. I mean, I'm sure it mattered to him. He would go to New York, things wouldn't happen. He wouldn't get any, get in museum shows because it was nothing but abstract art. But he went, um, he went in the studio every single day. And, uh, you know, just kept, kept working. He just refused to give up and he refused to give up painting realistically, too. He just didn't want to didn't wanna do that. Um, in terms of themes, um, Kate already pointed out that a lot of his paintings have to do with family life, um, which is definitely the case. Um, other big influences were uh, societal changes. I mean, he was, uh, this painting over here, which you can take a look at later, uh, expulsion with Adam and Eve. They're actually being driven out of the Garden of Eden by a nuclear blast. So, uh, and he did about three or four big paintings on nuclear themes. Um, 
Uh, he was very concerned with the pr prolifer proliferation excuse me, of nuclear power. Um, he was very committed to the civil rights movement. Um, the painting that Kate showed about um, Martin Luther King. So there was a lot of social involvement in his life and his work that's reflected in his paintings. Um, he was interested in proverbs. He did a series of paintings on proverbs. Um, but a lot of it was about family and about, about human concerns. And one of the reasons for that is that his, one of his favorite books was Tolstoy's What is Art? I still have his uh, marked up copy. And one of the big themes in that is that art should serve a moral and a human purpose. And he felt in the 1950s with de Kooning and, um, de Kooning, <laughs> Kate's nodding, de Kooning and Pollock and these guys, he used to say, you know, art is not psychotherapy. He said, you know, I don't, I don't want people to feel like they're getting psychoanalyzed when they look at my paintings. I want them to have a, a, a moral kind of connection. Um, just two other topics I want to touch on briefly. The, the technique that he always used was essentially a Renaissance technique of painting. He started with a white primed canvas or board, did a drawing, uh, then used a varnish or a spray to essentially fix the charcoal drawing so it couldn't be hurt by the application of other layers of stuff. And when he was painting with oils, um, and I'll talk about that in a sec, for example, The Man on the Skylight, um, the drawing is underneath. He would lay like a burnt umber, brownish ground over the whole thing. And then with colors, he would pull the composition up. He could still see the drawing underneath, and he would bring it up in successive layers, which is really a, a correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Kate, but I think it's pretty much an Italian Renaissance technique. Yeah. And then, well, we'll roll this up a little bit later on because everything on this side of the room is in oil. Everything on that side of the room are acrylics. In about 1960, he shifted over to acrylics and um, continued to apply the same, um, the same technique. A drawing underneath, um, flowing liquid acrylic over the surface and then pulling it up with um, I guess everybody can kind of see this. You can see they're kind of opaque, you know, he, you know, opaque whites and things like that that he uses to bring it up. So there are layers through the work. Um, it's also, we hope you have a chance to take a look at this one back here. That's um, Ode on a Grecian, it's based on Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn. Um, and it's uh, very, very, very clear in that painting to see how he, uh, the technique that he applied in terms of underpainting in it. So um, my dad continued to live and paint in the studio in the enclosure until 1971. Um, he died suddenly. Um, my mother continued to live there until she died in 1992 and then uh, we sold the house. It was just a little too much to, oh, there, thank you. There, that's a painting, that, a picture that I took of him in the 1960s um, in a studio. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Thank you. It's, it, really, it really is a joy, a joy to introduce people to my dad's work. So thanks so much.